Hello and welcome once again to another episode of Interesting Stories in the History of Diagnostics. This is Mickey Yerde for Halteris Associates. Today I'd like to talk about the human microbiome. I'm going to start with a brief history of our perception of the microbiomes around and in us. Uh, then I'd like to discuss our thinking about how the microbiome impacts our health, our understanding of its function, uh, its importance, and overall how it's going to impact healthcare. Sometimes I feel like people working in the microbiome space um, should have listened to Ernest Rutherford, the famous physicist, who once said, I think all of science is either physics or stamp collection. And sometimes I feel like when we're doing the microbiome research, it's stamp collection. Here's this group of bacteria. Here's this group of bacteria, but not really fundamentally understanding what they contribute. That's what we're getting to. And I think it's the right way to go. We've had a long and ever-changing perspective of microbes and how they impact us. It really wasn't until the late 1600s that the Draper and Tony von Leeuwenhoek in Delft, Holland, uh, created microscope lenses initially to look at threads because of his uh, Draper background, but he soon turned it onto anything he could find. And he found what he referred to as animalcules everywhere, in ditches, rotten water, and eventually in his own mouth and on his teeth. So we came to realize suddenly that we're not alone. And it really wasn't until the late 1800s that Robert Cook was able to associate microbes with human and other animal diseases, such as TB and cholera, and really started our belief that microbes are bad. You know, it took a while before we started to understand that it wasn't. But several years later, there was pioneering work from two individuals, Martinez Bejeronik and Sergei Wernogradsky, who recognized and created the uh, field of microbial ecology. They concluded that microbes are virtually everywhere in nature and are associated with larger organisms as hosts, and they had beneficial contributions. So that was a change in thinking. They're beneficial, as well as being pathogenic. Additional shifts in thinking came along as researchers began to recognize that these microbes live in interactive communities that contribute to one another to produce byproducts such as biofilms and bioluminescence. They can only do that as a population. And they can't do that as individuals within that population. We now know a lot more about how they communicate with each other with exchanges of things like quorum sensing molecules, which we did another episode of interesting stories on, and things such as plasmids and other forms of DNA exchange, so-called horizontal exchange. So all of these things have become known in, in terms of how microorganisms interact with themselves, and then translating that now into how they interact with larger organisms. The term microbiome was first described in 1952 by J. Moore from the Greek words meaning small and life. And he meant by, by this microbiome term, microorganisms in specific environments. That, that notion has uh, changed a lot over time. And most recently in 2020, the ever contributing Joshua Letterberg provided the following useful definition of the microbiome, which I like a lot. It is to him, a community of commensal, symbiotic and pathogenic microorganisms within a body space or other environment. At this point, we're still thinking about the, the broader sense of microbiome. You know, it's not just in a human, it, it, in this definition, it's more uh, things such as in plants and other animal types, and even in, within soils, all those things can be thought of as being a, a uh, community where these microorganisms function and contribute. So typically the sorts of things in these microbiomes with things such as bacteria, archaea, fungi, algae, protozoans, perhaps other proteists. But more controversial has been animal viruses, phages, mobile genetic elements, and relic DNA. Um, you know, all these things are things that people have kicked around for a long time. I'm going to include viruses in, the, def in uh, the example a little bit later here, because I think more and more people realize that viruses should be included, but uh, those other materials, you know, not yet. Before I turn to the human microbiome specifically, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the tools that we have developed over time and how they're being used to understand these uh, microbiota 
environments, microbiotic groups. So microbiota being the organisms themselves, microbiome being the microbes within the environment. So it includes the notion of the environment itself. So the earliest tool for studying microbes was, of course, the microscope. But microscopy was greatly advanced by improved optics and the use of chromophoric dyes pioneered by German chemists in the late 1800s. Um, later, there was the fluorescent dyes that they also created, but it wasn't until the 1940s that we had a fluorescent microscope to go along with it. The other major tool from the 1800s was growth of bacteria in agar and in petri dishes, uh, and petri being a member of Paul Ehrlich's lab in Germany as well. But only 20 years ago, we had only been able to grow about 50% of the bacteria that uh, inhabit the human mouth. Uh, that's changed a lot now. In fact, within the last few years, almost all of them have been cultured. So it's taken all this time, but not only uh, have we had ways to look at them with a microscope, but we can grow most of them. That's that's a major advancement, very recent major advancement. So another major advancement that took place uh, in the uh, 1900s was in 1977. This is just as DNA sequencing was becoming common. But then at that point, Carl Woese, who's famous for having brought us the archaea, and George Fox suggested that 16S ribosomal RNA would be a great tool for identifying bacteria, even if it can't be grown. We can sequence them and see what's going on. So now, coupled with PCR to amplify the microbiome, uh, actually the nu nucleic acids, of the microbiota within the microbiome, uh, NGS has become a great way to look at virtually any of these microbes uh, in a sample from their environment. So, uh, and, the, and the major way this is being done is sequencing either the uh, ribosomal RNA in the case of uh, bacteria or other known components of uh, a fungus or uh, other proteins, and then literally counting the number of sequence to determine the, the quantity of that particular organism present. So for instance, in the, in the microbiome studies, it's very convenient to look at many different types of bacteria simultaneously in one sample by using molecular barcodes uh, and then determining um, which particular uh, bacteria are uh, associated with that particular sample. In the early 2000s, there was a project put together by the NIH which was referred to as the Human Microbiome Project, which took the approach of sequencing. And the intent was to sequence uh, a number of microbiota from a number of different people to see what the variations are within and on us, uh, from person to person, whatever the, the commonalities were, they wanted to understand that. They focused on microbiota specifically that inhabit the skin, the mouth, the nose, the digestive tract, and the vagina. Machine learning has now led to our ability to uh, identify the specific genus of a bacterium at about 80% accuracy, which is pretty darn good. This field has now been supplemented over the course of the last many years with additional technologies such as proteomics and metabolomics. Uh, and thinking back to quorum sensing again, you need both proteomics and metabolomics to look at the quorum sensors from both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. I think it's amazing that virtually all these tools microscopy, growth, sequencing of all are all in common use today and being supplemented by additional technologies. The first major reports from the Human Microbiome Project appeared in Nature in 2012 in a series of articles. Uh, in those reports, it was reported, for instance, that individuals host thousands of types of bacteria, uh, that different spots on within the body can host very different levels of diversity. For instance, skin and vaginal sites showed smaller diversity than did the mouth and the gut. And that the makeup of any particular given site in the body varies dramatically from person to person, not only in type, but also in abundance. This was a bit of a surprise, and it's been a conundrum for quite some time, which I'm going to address a, a bit more here in a few moments. Let's just kind of walk down the, the memory lane here of the kinds of contributions that we now have found that uh, the microbiome uh, contributes to the, the human health. There's a well-known early study in the late 1980s that involved Jeffrey Gordon and his group that uh, had the notion of transplanting gut microbiomes from genetically obese mice and uh, genetically lean mice into a group of germ-free mice to see what would happen. So despite all the mice eating the same diet, those germ-free mice that received microbiomes from obese mice gained more weight. 
that was a surprise. Look what the microbiome can do. This led to a number of people referring to Gordon as uh, the, the, the father of the microbiome for this work. Although I'm not sure everybody would say that today. But uh, it really did, without a doubt, renew the interest in the links between the gut microbiome and human health. Much more is known today. In the gut, for instance, the microbiota helps to improve and maintain gastrointestinal functions and influences the developmental aspects of the adaptive immune system. Uh, the microbiota also interacts with and degrades external contaminants, such as heavy metals, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, pesticides, ochratoxin, plastic monomers, and toxic organic compounds of a variety of types. So that's a pretty significant contribution. Uh, they also actively break down complex dietary constituents, such as indigestible complex carbohydrates. Um, and they assist the intestinal cells in doing so and then making uh, complex food materials readily available for absorption and assimilation, which is very important. Similarly, in the female genital tract, there's a protective mechanism which is initiated by the, the local microbiota, which is responsible for inducing innate immunity, including the secretions of cytokines, antimicrobial peptides, and other inhibitory substances. So there's a lot of complex biology and microbiology going on here uh, that contributes to human health. But despite this and much more work, the field has been struggling to make sense of it all. Uh, for instance, there's been a great struggle to understand what is a normal, healthy human microbiome. It's been shown several times that the microbiomes from human populations living in industrialized areas are dominated by the genus Bacterioides, while hunter-gatherer populations exhibit a high abundance of the genera Provotella and Treponema. Really very different from a human microbiome uh, project paper in that uh, 2012 issue of Nature, there was a statement, we found the diversity and absence of each habitat's signature microbes to vary widely, even among healthy subjects, with strong niche specialization both with, within and among ind individuals. That was all the way back 2012. Then from a 2021 paper by Porus et al. that was in Cell Reports, is the following quote. In spite of the growing appreciation for the large scale differences in the composition of microbiomes throughout the world, studies causally linking the microbiome to health and disease outcomes have not broadly considered the global diversity of the human gut microbiomes. Isn't that amazing? Still, we have this problem. I really think that this requires a rethink in the area, and I think we're starting to see that rethinking taking place. So. Here's sort of my naive thinking about this. I, I got to say, I'm not an expert in this field, but I have talked to several people who are. So I'm going to use sort of a silly what if story about nutrition. So my uh, what if is, suppose we didn't understand what the major contributors to a healthy diet were. We didn't know about proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins. And so we began studying the diets of uh, peoples around the world. We would see local patterns of fruits, vegetables, grains, meats, fish, etc. But we'd be a bit bewildered by how that variety across places and societies can happen. I mean, how is it that all these people are healthy when they eat such different things? Yet when people move to another location, they often adapt their diets to the new foods that are available, and they're still healthy. Why does that work? Well, what we don't know in my ridiculous story was that as long as you get the nutrients offered by the local foods, you're going to remain healthy, right? I mean, you can get your complete proteins from beans and rice, from meat, or soybeans. There's vitamin C and citrus fruit, cabbage, and white potatoes. We can eat a whole variety of things that will end up giving us the nutrients that we need. So I think this is a new way to think about the microbiome going forward. I know this may be not obvious, but it's not the specific makeup of our microbiomes. It's the specific contributions from them. I've got cabbage, you've got oranges. I mean, we don't need to have identical microbiomes to be healthy. We need a complete microbiome that has the contributors that are necessary for our health. All right. So I'm speculating about this, but I think this is going to come to, to fruition. And it's not as though this is unprecedented. I'll give you as an example. A company that I've known for a while called Gusto Global. I've been an advisor to them, so I just wanted you to know, know that that's the case. But they've developed a 
a scalable method for identification and quantifying cell-free microbial DNA. That's an important tool. But this team has had many years of experience in developing products for agriculture based on the type of systematic thinking about the contributions of microbiological function within the environment. So not just which organism, but which specific contributions are they making? So their application of their approach is leading to an understanding of the interactions amongst the microbiota and key human organs now uh, and, and with the host itself. So insights are coming daily, such as you know primary metabolite production, inflammation control, pathogen control, and proliferation. So I think this is the way to, to think about this. What are the specific mechanisms? What different organisms can actually contribute those? And if we see in one population, one organism that's contributing in another organism, another population, that's fine. As a matter of fact, as our microbiomes change, it's entirely possible that the specific contributors of that function are changing. That, that, that might just happen. Uh, well, certainly we do see changes over time in individuals, but we can't say specifically at this point, I think, that that person has become less or more healthy. But I do think as we start looking carefully at this and we can identify what the true definition is of a healthy microbiome, we will then be in a position to say, aha, they are missing this contribution. And perhaps then the, the approach to um, a microbiome replacement, which many people are trying to do right now, will be much more systematic. It's not just you know this genus. There are lots of possibilities, some of which may be better in a replacement approach than others. So I think that's where this is all going. There are many companies in the microbiome space, mostly in some aspect, the therapeutics. For instance, the company Axial Biotherapeutics, they're focused on neurological disorders. Resbiotic, which is focused on lung health and the microbiome within the lung. Finch Therapeutics, they're looking at a variety of different things. Second Genome, which is looking at protein drugs associated with what they believe to be a healthy microbiome. Persephone Biosciences, which is working on oncology drugs. And my favorite, Oralta, which is looking at probiotics for bad breath, which is clearly caused by having the wrong microbiome in your mouth. Other companies looking at tests associated with the microbiome, such as BiomeSense, and they're developing ways to track microbiome profiles of individuals. Biome is offering a series of home tests, which they think uh, could be useful in determining how to improve one's nutrition. And then animal biome, which is doing both therapeutics and diagnostics for companion animals. Now, I'm not sure yet that we know enough about how to take on many of these problems, but I do believe as we learn more about how these microbiota communities function and what their relative contributions are, we will learn what defines a healthy microbiome. And that in turn, combined with what we're learning about uh, human biology in general, will mean that we can define a healthy human in both the sense of the host cell contribution and the uh, contribution of the microbiome. So we've had a long and evolving relationship with microbes. We now know that they're an integral part of us. We're starting to understand what they contribute and how. We haven't yet, but will develop a clear understanding of what constitutes a healthy and unhealthy human microbiome and unhealthy and healthy human as a result. I know many people are offering microbiome tests today to guide aspects of our health, but before we use them, you know, we really should look closely at the data. Do they really have sufficient support for their claims? I have my doubts in some cases. Um, as Carl Sagan once said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But I think tests and drugs based on our understanding of our relationship with our microbiome are coming. They're gonna be important and they're gonna make a major difference in our health. Uh, I don't have any doubt about that. I just don't think we're quite there yet. And we'll report on that when we get there. So thank you once again for listening to another episode of Interesting Stories in the History of Diagnostics. This is Mick Yearday for Alteris Associates. Bye.